And we say this all the time, I think in the spiritual life and the saints, we make this point that behind the passions are the demons. And when you fall down to worship the passions and you fall down to worship uh, your desires, you, you deify your desire, you deify that thing that you want so desperately, uh, the new car, the wonderful uh, iPhone and all the rest, nothing becomes object of worship. You're actually worshiping the demons because behind that passion that you're in, you're embracing and enjoying and reveling in are the sexual passions or the drug addiction and all the rest are the demons. It's not just a created thing that you're worshiping, but behind that, as it says in Greek, empolevi, it's like it is uh, buried in it. It's uh, it's hidden in it. It's it's hiding in these things. And we see this actually, and the elder talks about that. We're not going to get into it tonight, but that in creation, and we see this in the prayers of exorcism and, and baptism, that the church teaches us that in created things, the devil dwells and hides and, and, and uh, uh, to the point of possession, somebody could be possessed. And, and, but in other ways, we see that in the scriptures that they didn't, they, they didn't want to uh, be judged before the time. It says there in the Gargarasines where he sends, he sends them into the pigs, right? And they go running off uh, to destroy the, the, the villagers' uh, way of life uh, so that they might you know, calculate that maybe they'll reject Christ because of this. So they're trying to undermine Christ. And it is, uh, they f go into these things, these created things, right? The demons. And so... Uh, it is possible that if you give your heart to created things, you're actually going to be giving rights to the enemy of salvation and the demons. It's not that simple uh, as you might think. We see, for instance, in the ancient lives of the martyrs, that when they would go uh, to stand against, them, I'm trying to think of, uh, 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 I think it was St. George, for instance, uh, they would speak, they would scream, they would yell. Uh, these these inanimate objects that people were worshiping because in them were de uh, dwelling the demons and they would uh they would say for instance when they approach the relics of saints they're burning me demon possessed people would go to the great elder um um uh, just his name just escaped me but who was casting out demons in athens uh and and they would scream and yell when they would approach uh the relics or the holy icons because the, the presence of divine grace literally spiritually burns them and they flee. But they're within the created things. We can see this in many examples in church history. It's not just, it's not just in this, though. It's also in other elements. And this is extremely pertinent to our discussion going on today. Uh, we've seen this. I've been having this discussion with people online after we posted a one-minute excerpt from one of my uh, question and answer sessions when we're talking about the sexual sins. Uh, and the particular blasphemous acts that happen even within marriages, even in Orthodox marriages, where we take the organs that are for praising God uh, and other things and we turn them into, uh, we defile them and we use them for things that are not meant to be used. I think you understand what I'm talking about. Now, the sexual perversion is a form of, uh, is a fornication, or rather is a form of idolatry. Listen to what the elder has to say. Sexual reproduction is something planned by God. God designed it, and this plan of God is placed within the context of two elements, the element of pleasure and the element of purpose. Element of pleasure and the element of purpose. This is the plan of God, even though a secondary plan, and it was enacted after the fall, is still the plan of God. It is still the economy of salvation for mankind. Now, from the very moment that man separates these two elements of pleasure and purpose, always within the context of marriage, and becomes focused on the pleasure while displacing the purpose, which is childbearing, which is procreation, which is the continuation of the race, he worships the very thing that God would not want. He becomes a idol worshiper. Again, when you separate purpose and pleasure, when you put aside the purpose, the, why God blessed this, 
the procreation of the race, and you separate that, now you want to autonomize and you want to have without the purpose, it becomes purposeless, it becomes an end in itself, the pleasure, then you have idolatry. He worships pleasure and gives a chance to the miserable, filthy devil to slither in and opportunely bury himself there. And for Levi, that's what we just talked about, right? He hides himself in that pleasure that you're worshiping or I'm worshiping when we separate purpose and pleasure in terms of reproduction, right? We, we undo the plan of God, which is what God uh, intended. He didn't want these two things separated. And we're separating them for the purpose of our own, uh, uh, you know, pleasure and its end in self, and it's a kind of idolatry. Thus, fornicators practice idolatry. Fornicators practice idolatry because fornication, fornication is sexual pleasure without purpose. In other words, outside the context of marriage, or. Uh, potentially even within marriage in the sense of it becoming a distortion and a perversion of the purpose and, and nature of marriage. I guess that could also be uh, understood as fornication, although strictly speaking, fornication when you're outside of marriage and you're engaged in sexual activity. So fornicators practice idolatry because fornication is the separation of the purpose from pleasure. If you separate these two elements, you are involved in idolatry. Now, you may say, Father Athanasius, he was speaking to people in 1981 in Greece, right? A lot more conservative than it is today, I guarantee you. Uh, he would say, uh, you might say, this means that we all must be idolaters. Is that what you're saying, Elder Athanasius? We're all idolaters. And he surprisingly says, yes, that is what I'm trying to tell you all along. And now this is a long lecture we're at the end of the lecture here and he says yeah that's what i'm trying to tell you we're all idolaters that's what's going on today in the world do you not know that the unrighteous will inherit not inherit the kingdom of god now he's quoting saint paul of course do not be deceived neither fornicators idolaters, nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites will inherit the kingdom of god just an aside here some people might wonder, why is this separated homosexuals and sodomites? Because as you know, sodomy is usually synonymous or understood to be synonymous with homosexuality. It's not. Sodomy was not, sodomy is pertaining to what happened in the city of Sodom, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was not the only perversion of sexual activity that was going on in those places, right? The other kind of Distortion was also happening. So sodomy is not only the homosexual version, it's also the heterosexual perversion of sexual relations. People don't really understand that many times, but it does, I think, it's an umbrella term that has to, to do with the, all the perversion that was going on and the distortion and the idolatry that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. People realized this was idolatry. This was a total worship of pleasure in other words the passions in other words the demons and that's why there was no repentance and there was no return so let's read a little bit from the apostle paul here to refresh ourselves the patristic understanding the apostolic understanding fornication and idolatry are passions which constitute idolatry adultery i'm sorry our passions which constitute idolatry. And the devil is indirectly worshipped through these passions. You see in the Orthodox context how this is not a moralism. This is not about being a good person. This is not about doing things right. But we're talking a bit deeply about the enemy of salvation behind all the passions. That he came to do away with the works of the devil and the power of the devil and the death because the devil is the enemy, but then he works the enemy. And he's not the creator of evil. He's not the creator of hell. He's not the creator or author of, of sin, the Lord. But he's come to do away with him who introduced all these things. And all of the morality, all of the ethical life is inseparable from spiritual life. But you have a gross distortion in Western heterodox so-called Christianity in many places when things become 
about being doing the right thing, being the right kind of person. And it, it is detached from a deep spiritual understanding, the spiritual struggle against the demons. And we have simply the uh, you know a kind of righteous moralism, which is of course people reject. People walk away from because they don't see the deeper meaning. They don't understand the ultimate things here. How is it connected to loving Christ and all the rest? So let's go to Romans 1, 21 to 32. Let's read that a bit here. And let's understand things spiritually. Let's go deeper and not be moralist and, and superficial in our understanding of what's going on. We're in a terrible and 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 you know, just intense spiritual warfare with every breath and everything we do. It's who do you love? Who do you trust? Who do you worship? That's what's at stake in every day and every word and every uh, breath that we take. St. Paul, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay, we read that, but it's good for the context. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. Right? So these, you see the connection between fornication and idolatry? Right there. They're inseparable through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor and creeping things, wherefore, sorry, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. All right, so idolatry and sexual perversity, sexual uh, immorality, fornication, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Again, idolatry, inseparable here. There's no... Big chasm, you can't, I'm immoral, but I'm not an idolater. No, actually, those two, two things go together. Uh, who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. Because they, they, they were no longer worshiping God. And that's what happens when you fall away from the worship of God. You end up in this pit of affections. For even there... Even their woman, women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Sound familiar? We're living in the extremist of all the history of humanity. We're in the most extreme example of all this that they couldn't have imagined back then. The changing of so-called genders and all the rest that we're seeing. It's insanity. And what would the Apostle Paul say today? Oh, my goodness. Against, again, likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their own lust toward another, with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Believe me, the Greek is even more powerful than the English here. Uh, things that, as I'm reading, I'm thinking of the Greek and thinking this is much more powerful in Greek. But in any case, uh, unseemly, I think, in Greek is much more powerful. I remember the word, but... And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient. Again, I think the King James is lacking here. Being fulfilled with all, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, malicious, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful, who knowing the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Okay, so this is the image of the fornicator idolater that the, the elder is talking about here. He's saying, look, they're the passions which are essentially idolatry. I think it's really important for us to realize this because the, the idolaters do not inherit the kingdom of God. Idolaters fall down before Antichrist. Idolaters, and if we're gonna, if we're not avoiding even in our mind's eye, these things which lead to this destruction and idolatry, you know the Lord said. You know very well, and I know very well, the Lord said it's not 
doing it anymore. It's just thinking it that leads you to be a idolater, uh, a fornicator or an adulterer. So it's on the noetic realm that we have to translate all this struggle to be free of all this, right? This is why um, the noetic prayer and the deep Jesus prayer throughout the day is the key to avoiding all of this and to be constantly worshiping the creator and not the creature. 